So one last thing, it's also, uh, it's not today, but it was a few days ago, it was the, um, I guess it would be the 112th anniversary of the uh, the massacre at Ludlow, which was a Rockefeller uh, mine in Colorado. Um, and it was, it, the only reason why it kind of has some relevance is because today we're going to be talking about the opium wars. And the opium wars really is a war fought on behalf of, of, of free enterprise and companies, uh, uh, you know, and, and we have this idea today that somehow private corporations that, that governments have, it's, what's the cliche, governments have a monopoly on violence and coercion, um, yeah. which is, a you know, some, some yeah. myth that goes back to Adam Smith. Um, but here, it, you know, it, it, the miners were striking um, for eight hour work days for, you know, uh, union rights and um, and the mine just hired its own police force, including uh, like a, like a technical. Essentially, they had a a, a truck that they armed, they, they outfitted with some armor, and put a machine gun on it, and would spray over the tops of the tents where the miners' wives and children let, uh, lived. And eventually, um, eventually they they attacked and burned a lot of the tents down a lot and killed something like fifteen or twenty women and children. Um, and broke the union. Uh, there were some pitch fights, battles that went on after that, but uh, but they broke the union as they usually did when they when, when it came to violence. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, it's. I mean, that's that's a horrendous example. But but what we're going to be talking about tonight is uh, is far more horrendous, and and for some weird reason, very little discussed uh, because at the time all these horrific uh, events began, India was the property of a corporation, the British East India Company. I mean, it worked with the British government, but it was a corporation, and it was run as such. Yeah. And it was that corporation's drive to find a market in China that led to pretty much the destruction of China. Uh, and it was that company's drive to maintain its monopoly that led to unbelievable slaughters in India during the so-called mutiny. Mm -hmm. So... If anybody ever had any ideas that corporations can't commit mass murder on the scale uh, attributed to governments, well, it's because the view we have of, of 19th century history is really wrong. And I guess if there's there's something I want to stress about this broadcast, it's what we've been told about 19th century history is dead wrong. And, and for some reason, there are these massive horrors that that are just not discussed. Uh, they're acknowledged, and if if you uh, bring them up, you'll get a sort of acknowledgement in uh, perfunctory terms that oh yes yes some some uh, excesses were committed, but they're not moralized. I mean, some yeah. slaughters are moralized and some are not. Uh, for example, I was I was just wondering to myself tonight, like, why is it that everyone on either side of the Atlantic knows about the massacre at Wounded Knee, but absolutely nobody knows about the literally thousands of times larger massacres in Delhi at the end of the Indian mutiny. Um, somehow that is not moralized. Somehow that is just a fact of geopolitical history, one of those unfortunate things that happened. It's very strange, and it makes you a little frightened when, when you really look into it carefully. Well, I think one of the things you pointed out in the past would apply here. The, the Indians have been exterminated. The American Indians have been right. exterminated. Uh, essentially, and India Indians are still around. So, right. You know, yeah, once you've exterminated somebody, you can sentimentalize them. Mm -hmm. um, people who are still around are harder to sentimentalize. And, and also, I think, I, I've talked recently, just today, to, to some uh, people from India, and they say uh, their own histories tend to emphasize the positive, because uh, well, I, you know, I had an old Celtic studies teacher, a guy I like a lot, who I used to say, Ireland the raped. I don't want to hear about it, even if it's true. And, and I think there's something like that for every country that's been through colonialism. Um, they they don't want to hear about their country the raped. Mm -hmm. they, they want to hear about how this led us to our independence. So this guy I was talking to, a uh, very brilliant um, a fan of the show named Rishi Tandon, said, when he was getting uh, his history lessons in India, the, the stress was always on the birth of the independence movement, not dwelling on the horrors of, of the repression of the mutiny. Right. but and, and yet Nehru, I think, did write some pretty, you know, uh, vicious attacks. I mean, uh, you know, justified on, on the Raj, on the British Empire. 
Um, but uh, and and there, you know, the last British overseen famine in India that I, I, I'm pretty sure, well, certainly the last British overseen famine in India took place in Bombay. I'm sorry, not Bombay, yep. in in Bengal um, in 1943, 44, like three yeah. over three million uh, Indians died of starvation and malnutrition diseases and um and all of that was done as usual with with the british famines uh while they were exporting foodstuffs and 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 oh, Churchill yeah. had a very open disdain for the people who were dying he basically said, let them die yeah there's there, there's a churchill letter yeah there's a churchill letter where he says no oh, no we need to ship ship the food to greece it's more important that the hardy greeks should it's, prosper than the I don't know, some info like the spindly Bengalis should continue. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, we'll find out as we discuss this today that Bengal was was always regarded very much as an economic asset to be used in any way that the corporation or later the government considered uh, useful because corporation and government are inseparable when it comes mm-hmm. to British India. Uh, they they thought of Bengal not not as being inhabited by people, but uh, as being a, a factory that could be used for certain things. And and at the beginning of the opium uh, wars, they wanted they they decided that they were going to use Bengal to produce opium. And among other ramifications of that um, very cynical decision was the fact that. Uh, land that had been used to grow the food that supported the people of Bengal was converted to opium production, and a lot of those people died, which meant absolutely nothing to mm-hmm. the people who were running the place. Mm-hmm. So let's, I, I thought, we just to introduce the, the whole the whole strange context of the, the opium wars and the Indian mutiny, which is really closely connected to it, the best way... Uh, is is to look at the sort of fractured half memories and and half guilty conscience that that still clouds around it. It's something that's not very well understood, but but there's a dread about it. Like just today, uh, or sorry, not today, yesterday, Boris Johnson, a British politician who's running for uh, mayor of London and is also, uh, I guess, he is mayor of London, and he's running uh, in favor of Britain's exit from the European Union reacted to Obama saying, you guys ought to stay in the EU, by saying, and this is a quote, uh, um, that it was uh, a symbol of the part Kenyan president's ancestral dislike of the uh, British Empire. Um, And that, first of all, is ridiculously bizarre. I mean, uh, Obama responded as... as, He's he's channeling Dinesh D'Souza there, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right, the Dinesh D'Souza theory that Obama is wreaking some sort of ancestral vengeance, mm-hmm. which if you ever listen to Obama for five seconds, is just ludicrous. Mm-hmm. And, of course, what, what Obama said when uh, this was conveyed to him is, Churchill, I love the guy. I love him. Uh, that, that's literally what he said. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and, but yet it, it suggests that there's some memory there that, okay, maybe we did some bad things in Kenya and maybe there's some kind of karma. I mean, poor old Boris Johnson can sleep easy uh, because there is no karma, as I've said before. Mm-hmm. But there, there, is, there is a vague guilt there. And, and the imperial guilt, I think the best way to describe it is by this um, Irish joke I heard once. Um, this, the, uh, a British soldier has just bayoneted this Irish peasant, and the peasant uh, is trying to scoop his innards back into his belly, and, and the soldier is laughing at him. And the dying peasant goes, just tell me one thing. How, how come you hate us so much? And the soldier looks around to see if anybody's listening and leans down and says, we'll never forgive you for what we've done to you. Yeah. Uh, that's true. They're, they're, and that's true. And it, yeah. I mean, that is true. That's what's kind of fucked up about it. Yeah, yeah. That even if the the people who were abused forgive, there's the fact that the abusers will not <laughs> will not go along with that. Oh no, mm-hmm. you don't get to forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> and and the opium war, which I'll I'll explain a bit later, provoked that that sort of guilt um, in in some British people, even when it was going on. Uh, for example, Thomas Arnold, who's who's known for a couple of things. First of all, he was the father of the poet Matthew Arnold. If you had to read Dover Beach in high school. That's Matthew Arnold. That's Thomas Arnold's son. 
The other thing about Thomas Arnold, if you've ever read Lytton Strachey's great book, Eminent Victorians, he's one of the four Victorian whited sepulchers who's caricatured there. But for once, he was his conscience worked properly on, on the uh, opium wars. And he said, quote, this war with China really seems to me so wicked as to be a national sin of the greatest possible magnitude, and it distresses me very deeply. I really do not remember in any history a war undertaken with such combined injustice and baseness. Ordinary wars of conquest are to me less wicked than to go to war in order to maintain smuggling, and that smuggling consisting of the introduction of a demoralizing drug which the government of China wishes to keep out and which we, for gain, wish to introduce by force. Mm-hmm. And that is a pretty good summary of what the opiate wars were about. Um, and, now, and Okay, so I'll explain how this all came about. And you have to be willing to see the 19th century fresh. Uh, you have to be willing to understand that the, the world was controlled by this monstrous entity, uh, a, a profit-based British empire and its little bully sidekick, France, uh, and that's France's role in this. I'm ashamed to say, just the, the bully sidekick, uh, and, and and sort of driven by the the uh, the East India Company, the British East India Company. Right? Yeah. I mean, which you know, it is essentially a government, um, it, yeah. it, and it's uh, indemnified against you know the, the shareholders get indemnified against certain liabilities. They unionize together and create essentially a private government within a public government. On a charter, yep. on a charter, we have to remember, you know, that when you hear about oh, a company was chartered, it's the reason why they were chartered is because they had to prove up until you know 100 years until the Industrial Revolution, they always had to prove that they were actually serving a public good. Uh, granted, right. they, they probably never were, but but that was the theory that, that they would get renewed every 10 or 20 years, and that was certainly upheld more in America because the East India Company was the company that that uh, colonists rebelled against here. That was what the Tea Party was about. It was right. about their monopoly on, uh, on tea, um, and uh, the colonists rebelled against it. And it's kind of ironic that the Republicans and the Koch brothers launched a Tea Party against government, because that was really against oh. the, the East India Yeah, but, you know? but you're assuming that any of those I people know, know, know yeah. anything about this. But it's very interesting that tea is going to come into this yes. story, too, in a mm-hmm. really important way. Um, there are some constants. There are some things that keep coming back into these stories. Um, so through by the late 18th century, British control a lot of India, and they control the rest indirectly through bribery and threats. So basically, the British control India. India is a very complicated political landscape, but, but they can do what they want. And when we say the British, we don't mean... Um, as, as you were saying, we don't mean a government. We mean the British East India Company. It is a company. It right. can do what it wants for profit. For profit. Its its only goal is profit for the shareholders. And included in its shareholders, of course, are numerous government people. So it kind yep. of goes in a circle. Yep. Yeah, it has a lot of constituencies, among them second sons. Um, right. Britain has a lot of second sons, and India is a great place to get rid of them. And the more brutal and stupid they are, the better. Mm-hmm. Uh you unleash all that uh, testosterone on uh, the unlucky people in the colony, and it keeps it out of the home country, which is very handy mm-hmm. for colonial power. So the <laughs> the British are trying to find a way to control China as they control India. I mean, we're talking about the centers of human civilization. Uh, the rest of us are really just an outgrowth. Human civilization is a product of South and East Asia. And they control South Asia directly. They want to control East Asia, China, as well. The trouble is, though, China has retained its independence, unlike India. And it's it's a world unto itself. It's so culturally and economic self-sufficient that the British don't have anything to sell that China actually wants. Uh, the British are having to buy huge quantities of tea from China. I mean, the, the slogan, all the tea in China, comes from the massive quantities of tea that... Mm-hmm. Uh, China, that the British were, and others were, were shipping out of China. But they, those ships come into China empty. And to a free marketeer, whether it's 2016 or um, 1840, that is the greatest sin of all. You know, you're wasting 
all those transport costs on empty vessels coming into China. Well, and you're also I mean, creating it, a, a trade deficit. Right. right? And, and right. That, then, then that becomes a, a problem, you know, that, that can become another problem uh, that is being talked about in yeah. the elections today. Um, right. And then also, of course, there's the fact that the, the, the Chinese didn't, they weren't gold bugs. To them, gold yep. was just a shiny gold metal. You can have it. They wanted silver and the British didn't have silver. Right, right. Trade. The Spanish had silver, but by yeah. this time, the Chinese had all the silver they yeah. could possibly want, and the Spanish were gone. So uh, there, there is something that a free marketeer, and really, this is this is an Ayn Rand war, yeah. only they were slightly more articulate than Ayn Rand or her fans. But otherwise, this is an Ayn Rand war. I mean, uh, this does not make economic sense, and that is the only thing that's immoral. Uh, so if you wanted to break into a market where the people don't, crave anything uh, that you have, well, let's see, what creates a craving? How about an addictive drug? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, what, what could be a faster way to create a craving than an addictive drug? Uh, the British happened to control huge areas of opium-producing uh, land in India, and so the obvious solution to their problem, if you don't have any conscience, is to force opium on China because it's a guaranteed market. Uh, once people start taking opium, they'll have to keep taking opium or they'll be in agony. Mm -hmm. um, so they decided that the Bengali peasantry were now going to become opium growers. Um, and by the way, that, that meant any uh, Bengalis who starved, just like you know any uh, Irish peasants who starved as they changed the Irish economy, were needless uh, collateral damage. I mean, it, it really didn't matter. Um, the problem was then, and it was a minor problem as I saw it, forcing uh, the Chinese market open because China had made opium illegal. The Chinese word for opium was foreign mud or uh, alien smoke. There were all these pejorative words. They, they were very wisely afraid of it, mm -hmm. and they didn't want it uh, in their country at all. Um, the, Chi the British had forced earlier uh, a few ports to open, especially Canton. Um, so in order to uh, hide the trade that they were doing in opium, because it was trying to create a need by producing more and more addicts, they started uh, developing opium clippers, a special kind of ship, uh, faster than other ships. Yeah. You know, you think of the, the uh, what are they called, cigarette boats or something, cigar that, are, that were used by the cocaine smugglers mm. in the Caribbean. Um, this was a special kind of drug smuggling ship. It was meant to be faster and more heavily armed than other ships so that it could get past the Chinese authorities. Um, and uh, so... They, these clippers, instead of making one trip from India to China and back per year, they could go three times. So this was helping uh, to produce more and more addicts, which produced more and more demand. I mean, an addictive drug is like the perfect free market product. It's incredible. Um, yeah. you, you can't lose. Yeah, can I, can I just read, because uh, I wrote about the tobacco industry and then, you know, the tobacco industry documents were revealed and so on. But this, it reminds me of, it's, it's similar to tobacco, except that so the tobacco doesn't even have the one saving grace, which is at least you feel good on opium. I, yeah. I, but tobacco is as addictive, if not more addictive than opium. Um, and here's Warren Buffett, you know, this richest or second richest man in the world. He made a lot of money off his huge stake in RJR Reynolds, which makes uh, uh, camels and, um, and a you know, gazillion other cigarettes. And he said, um, I'll tell you why I like the cigarette business. It costs a penny to make, sell it for a dollar. It's addictive. Wow. Yeah. 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 Warren would have fit right in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that was the whole idea. I mean, yeah, you, you didn't have to pay, pay the Mengalis anything. Um, just give them enough rice to get by. I mean, that, it's not like they had other options. So, yeah, the, the production costs were nothing. Um, and it was working. Um, throughout the 19, 1830s, just before uh, the first opium war, um, there uh, were already 3 million opium smokers in China, um, which was very worrying to the Chinese government. I and mean, we always think of the Chinese government uh, as having been corrupt and useless, but in this, they were not either of those things. They were really trying very hard um, to 
push uh, opium out of their country. Um, and uh, as as we look at China later in the century, you'll see why, because it's, it's a nightmare landscape. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, the Chinese and government... You can see, what, I'm sorry, but you can see how helpful it is for you know, for the West, for the British to have that only characterization of the, of the Chinese government right. at the time as just corrupt and venal, sort of like, well, yep. both sides were awful. Well, not really, you know, I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's that's how, yeah, that's how it's demoralized. As I said, some yes. uh, historical atrocities are moralized, some are demoralized, right. and this one is very much demoralized. But in fact, the Chinese were trying very hard mm -hmm. and very effectively. Um, in 1839, when the war breaks out, uh, the the local um, authority in um, Canton, uh, and I'm sure I'm pronouncing these Chinese names badly, please forgive me, Li Zexu mm -hmm. ordered uh, foreign traders to surrender all of the foreign mud, and he, uh, he confiscated 20,000 chests of it, which is about uh, 1,200 tons. Um, without offering compensation, which was an outrage to the free traders. Not only did he take their stuff, but he didn't pay them for it. Uh, he confined foreign merchants to their quarters as well. He, he even sent a letter to Queen Victoria saying, uh, in a polite way, because politeness is very important in Chinese culture, he said, your majesty has perhaps not been officially notified, and you may plead ignorance of the severity of our laws, but I mean... I, I inform you, we now mean to cut out this harmful drug forever. For some reason, that never reached Victoria. Not that it matters. Not that Victoria would have had a moral outrage on her own. But somebody got, got rid of it. So the British, faced with real opposition, no matter what they try to tell you, there was real opposition. Faced with real opposition, they said, okay, let's transfer to Macau, which the Portuguese owned. The Portuguese said, no way. You're making the Chinese mad. We don't want anything to do with it. Um, the Qing or Xing emperor uh, asked all foreigners to stop dealing with the British, and that was it. Uh, the British were being excluded from the market because they wouldn't get out of the opium business. They would not tolerate that. They sent the military. They attacked Guangdong uh, in, in southern China. They, uh, the war uh, lasted from 1840 to 1842, the first opium war. Um, they were defeated the Chinese were defeated easily. They hadn't really coped with a, a modern 19th century uh, European army before. And as a result, uh, the British got the island of Hong Kong. I mean, nobody thinks about this. Nobody I ever heard ever mentioned this. Yeah. Hong Kong exists because it was taken by a bunch of drug dealers as punishment for the Chinese government trying to stop them from dealing an addictive drug. Yeah. That's why there's a Hong Kong. Um, British drug so the, kingpins, basically. Yep. I mean, yeah. Yeah, but, but again, that is not a moral issue. It's really interesting what's a moral issue in history and what isn't. So, 1842, the British have, have defeated uh, the, the Chinese. They've occupied... Uh, Shanghai, and they signed the Treaty of Nanking, um, in which the, the Chinese have to pay a huge amount of money for, for daring to try to stop uh, the opium dealers. And Britain also gets a, a particularly humiliating uh, concession from China called extraterritoriality, which means British subjects in China uh, are immune to Chinese law. They can only be handed over to British authorities. So if you, a British citizen kills a Chinese, uh, it can't be tried in Chinese courts. Mm -hmm. You have to bring him to a British court, which may or may not be interested in, in dealing with him. Um, so that's a complete victory. And the results of the victory are that opium use zooms uh, in China. And this will go on through the rest of the 19th century to the point that uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, China was the consumer of 95% of world opium production. Um, but the British were not happy enough. They, they, wanted to get, they wanted China to surrender all sovereignty, so they kept pushing. This is a, this is a standard thing that happens in, in 19th century colonialism. You... You push at the at the country that you want to colonize. If it gives way, 
you're not happy, you just think, okay, good, it can be pushed. Let's push further. Um, so it wanted Britain above all wanted opium trade to be legal and to be and for the foreign ports to be opened, and for Chinese laborers to become a market item also. I mean, if you read old books, you'll come across the term coolie. Uh, coolie was a Chinese laborer who could be shipped anywhere in the world as as a a unit of labor to be uh, to be priced at whatever the contractor could get and fed uh, a little rice and a little opium and and that was that. They wanted so they wanted to deal opium to the people in China and they wanted to sell the people of China as as an export item as well. Um, can, I, so, can I just read a couple of accounts I have here? Um, yeah. Of what the what the British papers were reporting in for, in 1842 after the signing of the treaty, um, they called it a, a what a great and glorious thing uh, the war was. This is the Times uh, of London said perhaps no circumstance in the history of Great Britain ever gave such universal satisfaction to all classes of society in this country. Um, Illustrated London News wrote. Um, a large family of the human race, which for centuries has been isolated from the rest, is now about to enter with them into mutual intercourse. Vast hordes of populations breaking through the ignorance and superstition which has for ages enveloped them will now come out into the open day and enjoy the freedom of a more expanded civilization and enter upon prospects immeasurably, immeasurably grander. Sounds like, you know, Thomas Friedman meets David Brooks meets, I mean, yep. it's remarkable how, how similar. The, the languages. Yeah, we're in a frighteningly similar area. I mean, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's scary. The echoes. Um, I think there was a period in between where people didn't quite talk in such swinish terms, mm -hmm. but uh, they did then, and they do now. That's for absolutely sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I started in all this with with the uh, uh, with the Irish stuff, which now seems to me a relatively minor. Uh, horror in a chamber of gigantic horrors. But I recognize that tone of voice, that gloating, triumphalist. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, Carlyle, that buffoon, uh, says uh, the Irish will soon be extirpated, uh, just like the Cherokee uh, for refusing to become part of the family of mankind. It, mm. It's the same horrendous talk everywhere. Yeah. And uh, part of the reason that, that race, as understood by most American progressives, really doesn't cover it is that it didn't matter what color those people were. The Irish were, if anything, paler than the British, mm -hmm. um, and that meant nothing at all. They they stood in the relation of powerless to power, and uh, a few freckles weren't going to make a goddamn bit of difference. I mean, uh, the, the Chinese were, were a slightly different shade. Other peoples they were destroying, like the Zulu in southern Africa, were yet another shade. That really wasn't the issue. Mm -hmm. So um, the, uh, the 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 victory, even though they they crowed about it like that, wasn't sufficient. They they wanted open legalization, and they wanted basically to destroy China. They wanted no more Chinese sovereignty. They they found that an offense in itself. Um, so. Uh, when a, when a 19th century colonial power faces a situation like that, it pushes and pushes and hopes to provoke a reaction that it can sell in the yellow press as an outrage. And that outrage will bring the gunboats. So uh, in, in the late 1850s, a uh, French missionary um, was killed in, uh, in China for, for trying to preach Christianity. And Lord Elgin, uh, the British High Commissioner, uh, was openly delighted about this. I mean, Elgin is an interesting case, by the way. He's later, he will later burn the Summer Palace in Beijing uh, out of pure malice. Um, he was the son of the guy who stole the Elgin marbles from, from Greece, by the way. It's quite a family. Mm -hmm. um, so Lord Elgin says uh, that... Um, Oh, good. The French have an even better outrage than anything we've got. So now we can go to war. So in the late 18, in 1857, uh, the British find a way to go to war. Um, once again, the Chinese are trying to stop uh, the penetration of their 
territory by by drug dealers. Um, they they seize a ship called the Arrow, uh, arrest some of its crew. Um, eventually, they re- release most of them. The British start bombarding the forts. Uh, then they demand to be allowed to enter Canton. Uh, in October, uh, they bombard Canton very methodically. They fired one shot every 10 minutes at random into the city. Um, and then at the end of October, they blast a hole in the city walls, and the city is taken. Um, they uh, are interrupted at this point by the other major unnoticed horror of 19th century um, Asian history, which is the Indian Mutiny. Uh, this is one of the things I learned about the way I learned about the Mau Mau. I mean, we've talked about this before, right? The the Kikuyu uprising in Kenya was a was an atrocity with mm-hmm. um, tens of thousands of Kenyans killed, hundreds of thousands interned and tortured. But what I heard about was the terror of the Mau Mau. I heard about that from Mr. Bartlett in fifth grade. Mm-hmm. It, it was one of the shocks of my life to find out that the Mau Mau had killed a total of about 30 uh, British settlers, um, so that the the casualty rate was was well over a thousand to one. I never heard about the thousand. I heard endlessly about the one. In the British mutiny, we all heard, at least in my generation, about something called the Black Hole of Calcutta, where some British prisoners were killed through being pushed into a crowded room in in human conditions. But the British casualties of the uh, Indian Mutiny of 1857 to 1860 were minuscule. The Indian casualties uh, were appalling. And yet, I don't think anybody's ever heard about them. I mean, there, uh, there, uh, there was a, a massive uh, slaughter when the British retook the city of Delhi. Um, I'll, I'll read something again from the from the jubilant colonial press. Um, this is uh, late 1857, a letter published in the Bombay Telegraph and, and reprinted by all the British tra- p- press uh, after they retook the city. Quote, all the city's people found within the walls of Delhi when our troops entered were bayoneted on the spot. And the number was considerable, as you may suppose when I tell you that in some houses, 40 and 50 people were hiding. These were not mutineers, but residents of the city, who trusted to our well-known mild rule for pardon. I am glad to say they were disappointed. So there was a brief interruption uh, of the uh, the Second Opium War while the British destroyed any resistance in India. The Indian mutiny deserves a lot more treatment, and we'll have to talk about it in another broadcast. But um, in 1858, they went back to China. They they dealt with India. And there's there's always this relation between the two. India is where the opium is produced. Mm-hmm. China is where it's going to be sold. They had quelled basically a you know a strike at the production center, and now they can get back to uh, what you might call sales resistance right. at the intended market. Right, and it's also one thing I notice is, um, and even reading about the opium wars is, it's hard to find casualty numbers on yep. the locals. I mean, you'll find out about you know every damn Brit company man, or whatever, who died in one way or another. Yeah, but you have to assume all that bombing and all that bayoneting and killing killed, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds. Who knows? Um, I know yep, that. If, yeah. If, yeah. Go no, go on. Well, I was going to say the one thing we, you know, we know that that um, that famines in India got remo- you know, uh, exponentially worse from the time that the East India Company took over uh, in the 1760s or so, uh, 1770s. But I think was the first major famine in Cal- in, uh, in in Bengal uh, until the British left. The, the last famine in, in 1943. I mean. I, I think Mike Davis, he wrote that book, Late Victorian Holocaust. He, he estimated that uh, I don't know, up to 60 or 70 million Indians died in famines in India under yep. the British rule, um, you know, which we've never heard about. And usually these happen while the British themselves argued over, some British did, argued whether they should provide local relief. And it was always vetoed by the viceroy or the people at the top. 
No, this is the markets working themselves out, and they were you know shipping out all the grain that could have fed the locals for their for their own good. Yeah, you know what's interesting about that Mike Davis book though, which is a great book. It's his only book that wasn't a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah, I, no one talked about it. No, uh, there's there's something really weird going on here, and I think our listeners are going to have to tell us because. Um, we can talk about these things. Yeah, we can think about these things, but a lot of people clearly can't. You know, I, I the first thing off the top of my head is that it's it's direct. I mean, I, I've read one of his other books and I didn't like it at all, and it's the book that everyone seems to like, City of Quartz, and it's very it's full of all kinds of academic jargon, all postmodern mm-hmm. jargon, um, just yeah. to say that. Los Angeles is a screwed up city, you know, um, yeah. but, but late Victorian Holocaust is actually very direct and historical and brings you this really horrific recovered history of something. And I think it just may be too direct. It seemed to be, yep. it's kind of like why Schopenhauer is not taken seriously in academia is too direct. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a bummer, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, the, the, Battle moves north. I mean, what they want now, they've, they've taken this, we're in 1858, they've, they've taken southern China basically, and they held it until very recently. Remember, Hong Kong was only given up uh, about a decade ago. Yeah, 97. And, yeah. and you know, <laughs> remember how Hong Kong came to exist. I swear, it's worth remembering. If you're going to moralize part of the world, moralize all of the world, or just demoralize all the world. Don't moralize part of it and not the other parts. But anyway. Yeah, it's, it's demoralizing for us. But one other thing I think that's interesting is how Hong Kong, um, you know, uh, uh, basically transformed from um, a, a drug center into a financial center. And the links yeah. between the two are huge. I mean, I remember when the financial system collapsed in 2008 and 9, there was a UN study that, that basically said it was thanks to the global illegal drug trade and all the money laundering that went on that kept the banks liquid enough to even keep the economy wow. going because the, the, the black market kept the economy going, kept the banks sort of from completely collapsing. Um, yeah, the, the two are the, the two go hand in hand. So Well, yeah, I mean, that, that's this story. That's this yeah. story completely. And, and it's a completely new 19th century or at least I never heard about it. I mean, I went to a school which was supposed to be full of Marxist historians and, and where there were swarms of student activists yammering all the time. And I don't know exactly what they were yammering about, but they sure as hell never talked about any of this. And I would like to know why not. So the the British now moved north with the French very much acting as the bully's sidekick uh, in, a, in a sort of... Uh, amphibious warfare, moving along the coast. Uh, they're aiming towards uh, Beijing or Peking or Peking, as it was known at the time, uh, to threaten the emperor. Um, and they reach the mouth of a river near Beijing. The emperor sends in his best Mongolian general, uh, because you know this was still a, an originally Manchu dynasty, and uh, they trust the Mongolians above uh, Han Chinese generals. And this general, Sange Rinchen, uh, fortifies the Taku forts uh, near Tianjin on the coast uh, near Beijing. And uh, the British attack uh, in June, and they are actually beaten. And four gunboats are sunk. And that explains what happens next. Um, Colonial armies don't like being humiliated because they they work on terror. I mean, if we're going to use the word terrorism, then a a gunboat army is a terrorist army. What it means to do is to stand offshore and say, we can kill everyone in your city. Uh, Our our weapons are indiscriminate. You have no hope. Uh, And if someone sinks those gunboats, the terror is broken. And and that's what happened. Chinese morale zoomed. British morale plummeted. Um, so the, there was a third battle with an amphibious landing, a much bigger one, 11,000 British troops, 7,000 French troops. It's always like that. You know, the British have the bigger force. They're in the lead. The French are, uh, the French are in a really kind of disgusting role in, Mm -hmm. in the mid 19th century, always trying to be as big and evil as the British, never being as big, but sometimes managing to be all too evil. Mm -hmm. Um, so. Uh, they land near the Taku forts. They take the forts and march into Beijing. Um, 
and at this point, uh, a typical late colonial battle, um, the Battle of Palikau, 10,000 Chinese troops are destroyed, just slaughtered. Uh, you have actual, and it's kind of sad if, if you're a Mongol fan like, like I am, Mongol cavalry charging into repeating rifle fire uh, and uh, just being slaughtered. There were almost no casualties. And speaking of casualties, there were almost no casualties on the British-French side. Uh, the entire 10,000-man force was uh, killed or wounded on the Chinese side. After that, they occupy uh, Beijing, and in an act of pure vengeance, um, the uh, gracious Lord Elgin orders the Summer Palace to be burnt to the ground after being looted. He wants to destroy the entire Forbidden City, the you know the the royal quarters, uh, but uh, it's the Russians who actually who actually throughout the story, I have to say. Uh, the Russians come off as relatively human here, and the Russians say, "No, you can't do that. You can't destroy the the most sacred spot in Chinese culture." So he settles for burning the Summer Palace. Um, then a humiliating treaty is signed, the Treaty of Tianjin. Uh, the war ends. China has to pay another en- uh, indemnity. Opium is legalized. Um, Britain acquires Kowloon across the water from Hong Kong proper, uh, and opium floods into the Chinese market that that rises from 2,500 tons in 1839. And 2,500 tons of opium is uh, a lot of opium. It doesn't take a lot of opium to get somebody high, Mm. I'm told. (laughs) Um, (laughs) To, uh, yeah, to 6,500 tons in, uh, uh, 1880. Um, so, um, by, and th- this is almost where I come into the story because I've always been fond of uh, narratives about people walking through China to Tibet, you know, and a lot of weird Europeans did that at the beginning of the 20th century. And the world they describe is is a horror. Uh, they say that the Chinese have been turned into zombies by opium, and they describe cities. Um, that were once three times their current size. Uh, most of the houses are deserted. Uh, children are often abandoned by parents whose only concern is getting high. Uh, the The population is shrinking. It's People don't remember that, but the population of a lot of the non-European world was shrinking. These were often called the vanishing races. Mm-hmm. And opium was shrinking the Chinese population faster than anything else that could be imagined. And and they see a world that is on its way out and totally due to opium. Uh, no one has any interest in doing anything except their next pipe. Um, so it worked incredibly well. And the, the two centers of human civilization, by any objective standard, South Asia and East Asia, were destroyed in this kind of reciprocal, um, horrible process uh, by the same power, uh, one forced to become the producer of the addictive drug, the other forced to become the consumer, but both devastated in the process. It's it's a pretty monstrous story. Yeah, it is, and and from what I've read as well, in the mid late eighteenth century, um, these two regions, certainly the the Bengal region uh, of India and um, you know and China, were were comparatively wealthy. Um, oh yeah, to the British. Yeah, I mean, they they looked certainly the Chinese looked at the British as as a bunch of animals. Um, yeah, and yes. uh, you know by the end of the nineteenth century, both regions were utterly devastated and yep. you know, took forever to recover. Some uh, Bengals barely still recover. Yeah, 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 and and yeah, it's true. Uh, the the life expectancy of an average farmer in central China was twenty years longer than that of a European of the same era in the early modern period. Um, they didn't want foreign stuff because they had a sense that it was dangerous, but more importantly, they didn't need anything. They had a self-sufficient world and a massively impressive one. Yeah. So, you know, so when, uh, when these countries are suspicious, let's say, of, um, you know, free trade policies and policies trying to push products in them, they, I mean, historically have a sense, I mean, you need to understand historically why. Historically, they have a sense that 
trade is not just about trade, but it's also about imposing power. I mean, um, like the British East India Company, what they did is they would go in, get a concession, bribe people so they could get essentially the same concession, you know, good concessions from local rulers, bribe and terrorize, and then use that to create a monopoly. And once you have a monopoly on anything, on trade, on, on uh, you know, on agricultural products, you can do anything to the people. I mean, you can extract rent from them. You can you can set their wages at what you want to because they have no other choice. Um, yep. And uh, yeah, the the line between economic and military yeah. in these stories, there's no line. There yeah. is no such yeah. thing. I want to read. This is this goes back to even your, the joke uh, that you told at the beginning of the show about the um, the British soldier bayoneting the Irish peasant. Um, this is from Julia Lavelle's book, The Opium War, which. Um, which the more I've gotten into this war, the more I'm starting to think, well, maybe it's not so bad because one thing that bothered me about it, I think I told you before, was that she she, she seems to do the thing of sort of trying to show both sides of the story too much. I mean, there's there's a bit of obfuscation of the real horror of it. Um, but now I'm realizing after having, I tried listening to some other British podcasts about the Opium War, it's... <laughs> I thought the British were, were, were pretty tough about this stuff, about their horrible history. Every show, basically, they say, we never learned anything about this. And, but really, the, the Chinese were as bad as we were. Isn't that really the lesson that we learned? Um, so, so anyway, here's, here's what she writes here. <clears throat> um, she's talking about, you know, she doesn't get specific about the numbers killed, but she does say that, that there's a weird sort of, subliminal guilt on the British side, which manifested itself in more horrible ways. She says, but war guilt can also have the opposite effect, leading to ever more militant acts of, of self-justification. And again, think neocons here, too. Yep. Um, once blood has been spilt in dubious circumstances, those involved often try to brazen it out, first through blaming the injured party for forcing them to act thus, and second through affirming the validity of, the, of their violence by persisting with it. Through the 19th century, this pattern of response seems to have governed the behavior of many of the most influential opinion makers on China in countries like Britain. For the most part, traders, diplomats, missionaries, later on journalists and scholars. These groups rejected the idea of empathizing with the Chinese empire, publicizing instead the insufferable sins of the Chinese that had necessitated the first war, their pride, their xenophobia, their resistance to change, their heathen cruelty and immorality all of which could only be subdued by yet more punitive violence. It also reminds me of the whole anti-Russia lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, yeah, it's a form of cognitive dissonance, really. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't be in the wrong, therefore, and from then on you're just casting about for whatever nonsense you can come up with. Yeah, and it leads in all sorts of, as you say, very sordid, very sleazy ways, among other things, to the whole sexual panic involving the yellow peril at mm -hmm. the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. the sense that there will somehow be a vengeance inflicted on white women for what was done to China. Right. Yeah. So, um, and, and another thing, the Opium War sort of mess, you know, create a little co cognitive dissonance with me is, I mean, well, look, I, I'm I'm against the war on drugs. I'm definitely against. Yeah, um, this, that, I mean, no, this is this where it gets it. tricky. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but you know, but we but we can look at this two ways: <laughs> um, yeah. personal way and sort of um, a, a more objective way, for lack of a better way of putting it. Um, even after this, I still think nobody should go to jail or, or you know have their liberties denied or something just for whatever they do in their own home, whatever drug they do. It's, it seems right. like under any circumstance, absolutely insane and cruel to me. But that said, the idea that the war on drugs, that ending the war on drugs will create some utopia and end all this violence. All you have to do is look at the opium wars or tobacco. Yeah. I mean, tobacco yeah. kills 6 million people around the globe a year. It's it's expected to kill cigarettes, a large uh, a billion people in this century, and mostly in the developing world, because um, you know in in the West uh, and Japan and so on. I mean, smoking rates have gone down a lot because you know the, we finally kind of defeated the tobacco lobby, um, and and so the, the rates are declining here. So what they've done is they've used actually free trade 
um, to break open into markets in the developing world where they can do the old bribery and, you know, and marketing to, to kids and so on, same old stuff. And, um, so rates. Yeah, that's really are, true. That's, you know, that's, wow. I, I hadn't even realized that, but yeah, they've got all these techniques. They're restricted from using them at home, but they can inflict them on mm -hmm. colonial populations. There, there's a letter from a Chinese official saying to Queen Victoria, but you ban this terrible drug in your own country. Why are you inflicting it on us? And the reasons are the same ones you described for the tobacco industry, because there's a much safer market there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in, and in fact, um, the tobacco industry is using some of these world, uh, you know, World Trade Organization or GATT. I can't remember that. There's so many of these treaties now in order to which act as a kind of super government. So now some local governments like in Australia and I think Uruguay and a couple other countries, their own laws to restrict tobacco are being challenged and overturned by the treaties the, that they signed. Um, and, and Philip Morris and R.J.R. Reynolds are using this to break in, you know, to break in these markets and have the right to sell to children and, and market to children and whatever they want to do. And, and also they use free speech rights <laughs> to do that, I mean, so you know, it kind of. I I don't really know what the sol what the solution is to that. I mean, it just I think the only thing to keep in mind is that the simple solution, which is end the war on drugs, it will end one problem, which is mm -hmm. or it will reduce, let's say, one problem, which is the um, you know, the crime that goes with making something illegal. Um, right. right. And create a new problem, which is you might actually massively increase the amounts of. of overall deaths, but they'll be legal. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know either. But uh, but I do know that the the nexus of, of mercantile and military is probably always going to be a very bad place. And, mm -hmm. and that's that, that's exemplified in this whole story. And the, the same free market jargon was used to describe all of this. In yeah. fact, it was used with a Christian overlay, which is yes. also very familiar now. I mean, the, yeah, the, a lot of hideous things have come back to life, like the Irish famine was justified by Lord Trevelyan under the saying, this famine is a judgment of God upon a stubborn and indolent people. But they were that, So the God was the first term. Stubborn and indolent meant economically inconvenient. So those things are always going to be mixed together, and they're always going to be backed by force. Right. I um, and speaking of that, let me find this here. I found this pretty horrible uh, quote. Um, uh, I don't know. This this is this has to do with the with the India famine. But remember, the India famines, the China famines, and the calamities in both countries were intricately tied. Um, and uh, here's the finance minister of Britain uh, talking about, um, I'm sorry, no, this is even worse. This is the final report. There was a famine commission uh, that issued a report in 1880 on what went on in, uh, in India. And it said here, quote, the doctrine that in time of famine, the poor are entitled to demand relief would probably lead to the doctrine that they're entitled to such relief at all times. And thus the foundation would be laid of a system of general poor relief, which we cannot contemplate without serious apprehension. Yep. Yeah, and, and if you doubt that that has changed, try reading Yahoo comments someday. Yahoo is well named. And that you'll see people who are outraged at the idea of a $15 minimum wage, but not in the least outraged by the 1.5 trillion we spend on the F-35. I mean, these, these arguments have uh, never died. I mean, I think they were in abeyance for a while after the Great Depression really mm -hmm. put the fear into the rich, as, as you've said many times. But they're back, and nothing has been learned. And they're, they're the same vehicle of lower middle class resentment mm -hmm. and oligarchical greed. Yeah, and all their gold control too. I mean, yeah. uh, keep us fighting with each other over those scraps. Yeah, and on that happy note, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. So, um, all right. So that's the opium wars, and. Uh...